Prof Professor Mfanelon Toby is a policy analyst, management strategist, and communication strategist with expertise in education, technology integration, and qualitative research. He is the CEO of Saibono Discovery Center and is a chairperson of several Gauteng based organizations. And uh, aside from that, he also serves as an associate research professor for Zambian University and is a member of council for SASTEC. His scholarship focuses on the pedagogical integration of technology in education with a current project exploring Ubuntu philosophy as a research paradigm in postgraduate initiatives. Uh, brace yourself for this one. Please put your hands together for this bright spark in the dark. Thank you. Next up is a man who I had the immense pleasure of chatting to on Monday, and uh, I also listened to his paper presentation. I feel privileged to have had the chance to plug into his electrifying wit. <laughs> Dr. Dino Petrarolo is the director at CCI GrowthCon and CEO of Next Renewable Generation with a career spanning leadership roles in Anglo-American, the automotive sector, and M M FMCG industries, which include Global Head of Manufacturing Development at Saab Miller. With a PhD in industrial engineering and extensive experience in board level governance, operational strategy, and supply chain excellence, he has worked with major clients like Coca-Cola and Distel. In uh, rec recognition of his contributions, uh, Dr. Dino has received the Martin K. Star Excellence Award uh, and he has a doctoral award which is named in his honor, which highlights his impact on emerging economies. Please help me welcome Dr. Dino. <laughs> Next up, another one. Next on our list of leading lights is Professor Kumbu Pofu, who cut his teeth at TUT and is the newly appointed Vice Chancellor of Solusi University in Zimbabwe. He is the Vice Chair of International Railway Research Board, a global leader with a strong background in industrial engineering, advanced manufacturing technologies, AI adoption. Good stuff, he's a very efficient industrial engineer. <laughs> and AI adoption. Having held roles as professor, research chair, and consultant, known for his adaptability and collaborative approach, Prof. Pofu has excelled in managing diverse environments and leading critical projects in mechatronics industries. Fourth on our superstar lineup is Dr. Bridget Samula, CEO of the Engineering Council of South Africa, civil engineer with a PhD in transportation engineering and an MBA in aviation management, over 23 years experience in research, academia, airlines, ports, rail. She has held, thank you, madam. Good. It's clever trying to stop you from speaking. <laughs> <laughs> good one, good one. I like that. She has held leadership roles at AECOM and contributed to various global infrastructure projects. Passionate about mentoring and social impact, she has served on transport boards, advised universities and cities, and authored numerous papers in the field of Afri African aviation. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for Dr. <laughs> Last but definitely not least is a man light years ahead <laughs> in the industrial engineering path in all respects. A man who I have deep, deep respect for and look up to. Professor Connie Skitter is the Vice Dean of Research and Industry Liaison at Stellenbosch and the former Chair of the Industrial Engineering Department, where he has played a key role in establishing that department as a national benchmark. He's an honorary fellow of this society and an editor of our journal, um, Saji. Outside of work and academia, he's also a devoted husband and father to three children. Prof. Tony, thank you. Yes. So these individuals up here have obviously done a lot for themselves, their communities. So it was very difficult to try and summarize, but I think I did manage to summarize um, their profiles. So let's get into it. Okay. So the first question will be directed to you, audience. In your opinion, what is the single piece of innovation that has led the human race to be, to become the dominant species on this planet? In your opinion, what is the single piece of innovation that has led to the human race becoming the dominant species on this planet? There we go. 
Thanks, thanks for a few who will come next. The light. The light. Fire. Fire. Okay, good. Yes, sir. I think the fact that uh, African people are using cow dung to sanitize the floor and so that they can put the sludge for a machu is amazing. <laughs> okay, good stuff. One more. <laughs> Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Jamie. Jamie, one more. Yes. Um, I think language. I language. think that allowed us to communicate like and therefore uh, Good. collaboratively work. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Since Prof Kone was so eager to take it on. As an engineer, I'm going to suggest the wheel, motor cars, gears, stuff like that. Okay, so, so we're getting into the discussion now. We're speaking about innovation and illumination. We've got light, we've got how done, <laughs> <laughs> and language. Your comments, sir. Prof, let's go. My comment? <laughs> well, I think um, innovation is something that is coming out of a need somewhere. And in the case of the wheel, I'm not sure about a cow dung one, um, fire, light, there was obviously a need for something. Humanity had a need for something. Innovation is not only just creating that invention, the fact that you can now make a fire, but also how do we keep it successful moving forward. So that's my starting comment. Thank you, Prof. Um, can yes, Dr. Bridget, you can go. Yeah, um, I first thought fire, but as I think about it, it is our ability as human beings to use creation, right, to be able to then create what doesn't exist. So if you think about it, engineering is the creation of things that are mimicking things that already exist. So the aeroplane is the bird. So when you're studying how to fly, you studied the bird. Um, if you think about phones, they're mimicking the skin, um, especially the touch screen phones. So th I think that for me was our ability to innovate. We wanted to create what we found naturally so that we can be able to use it to enhance our own lives. That's a very interesting perspective, uh, Bridget. Thank you very much. It's our creative ability as engineers to mimic the creation that we see that is already in existence. Yeah. Um, Prof. Kumbu, do you want to chip in? Yeah, I'm thinking about discomfort. Mm. It's discomfort that, that drives us to say, how do we change this state of lack of comfort? Whether okay. it's darkness or it's raw meat, I don't know. <laughs> or it's, um, you know, asking yourself, why should I take three months to get to London? Why not 10 hours? You know, it, is it possible for me to get to London in 10 hours? Then, okay, I'm not comfortable about the three month shift journey. Maybe there should be a way of, you know, getting to London in 10 hours. So, the discomfort, and I think discomfort most of the times is um, taken for granted, but uh, it's, 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 it's the discomfort that makes us who, you, who we are. When, when, when COVID hit, uh, everyone thought that there was going to be drama in Alexandra, uh, you know, and they started digging the one million graves and all that. And uh, what happened, you know? Not so many people were dying in Alexandra because people's conditions and difficulties had made them strong to deal with COVID. At least my theory. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Prof, for that disclaimer at the end. So I, I think... <laughs> So I think the very important factor that you've brought to the fore is uh, basically what is driving innovation. They, there must be a need. There must be a discomfort. Dr. Dino, I, I, I'd like to... to I, I'm not going to... We want to wanna keep going, right? But, but what, what I want to ask you is, in your experience, uh, either saving companies or running renewables, what does innovation look like? What, what I think that's it. What's, what, what's innovation? Yeah, I think um, um, context from what has been said is, is important. So on the one hand, 
context is, um, is the environment that you're in and the need, you know, if, if there's uh, scarcity. So if you look at, um, you know, if you look at history, cold countries, countries where they have very harsh winters, um, you know, and you look at what that drove. I mean, there's lots of studies that have been done in terms of, um, of survival and survival of the fittest and, and so on. So that's context in terms of the harshness of the environment. The other context, of course, if we talk about what Bridget said about creativity, you know, you look at the, the big philosophers, the, the context was that they were living in an environment where they were given opportunity to think, opportunity to, to be creative. So the context becomes quite, quite important uh, as, a, as a driver. And today as well, you know, you, you, there, there's a lot of ideas, but there isn't perhaps um, opportunity, and that's again context, to actually get it to life. A lot of people come up with a lot of ideas, but the execution is, is, is quite uh, difficult. Um, yeah, so I think that's kind of what I'm seeing. That's, that, that's a good contribution, yeah, basically, I think, building on to what uh, Prof Kumbu mentioned about um, the driving factors that, that fuel innovation. You mentioned the case of cold countries that force people to look for fire or go to warmer climates. Uh, warmer climates. So, obviously, if you're in a, in a space of discomfort, you're going to lose. It's a challenging space. I, I think even now, people know that if you're in a comfort zone, you do not grow, you, know, you don't expand. Um, that's what drives us to, to innovate. Uh, Prof. Uh, Pat, in, in terms of innovation in your organization or in your experience, what does that look like? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very uh, tricky one, but I must say the prism through which I see innovation is informed by my ontology and my epistemological stance. I'm a scholar practitioner. It's rare that uh, you get an opportunity to test and implement your innovations and ideas. Mm -hmm. And I do that amongst the young ones. But at the same time, I'm a decoloniality scholar, proclaimed. I, I promote uh, the use of indigenous knowledge systems in innovation. And I always argue that uh, we don't ideate in abstract. We seek to resolve complex problems that confront society. So innovation and research are not neutral. They're not culturally neutral. So inclusivity is very important. And it's also important that in innovation, we promote our knowledge systems. That's my stance. OK, that's a good one. Um, but I think innovation in isolation cannot really achieve anything, right? I think the arm that entrepreneurship plays, or what entrepreneurship does, is that's what brings our innovation to life. Um, I, I'd like to come back to you, Dr. Dino. Entrepreneurship, I think you've dabbled in entrepreneurship. You're an entrepreneur yourself. Um, tell me what you think is the intersection. Are these two mutually exclusive things, if you talk inter entrepreneurship, innovation, if they're not two separate and there's an intersection, what is the extent of the intersection? How much should the intersection be to allow that innovative idea to see the light of day? Yeah, I think um, yeah, yeah, entrepreneurship is, um, uh, is, is it's very difficult and it's not for everyone. Um, in, in my case, uh, I had a career in, in um, in big organizations in my CV, and then taking a step out. I mean, it was not quite like uh, the KFC story of Colonel Sanders, who started it at, at age 63. Um, but it is, I think it is, it is easier to, to be an entrepreneur when you're younger, because you, you take more risks, you have more freedom, and you know, people have spoken about that. Um, but at the same time, um, if you look at how many uh, companies fail, in their first year, in their second year, and so on. I mean, getting the stats to, to themselves, um, and they don't they don't fail because of, of poor ideas uh, or innovation. They fail because of um, 
of, of basic business structures of, on, uh, of cash flow uh, and so on, which is also written about. So getting that mix right of uh, innovation and still being an entrepreneur and still making a viable business. Um, some people get it right by having a different mix of people in the organization. So they'll have one person, you know, if you look at the Steve Jobs um, um, and, and his, his chief um, technical officer story um, and how they, they um, uh, navigated um, Apple. Um, so I think um, in the entrepreneurship, Sort of space, um, it's um, you do get constrained. Your innovation does get constrained um, by your by your governance and other factors, and that's that's very difficult. A pretty green picture or conservative picture, if I can say that you're painting, Dr. Bridget. Would you have a comment? Um, I do, and as he was speaking, I was thinking about the Mark Zuckerbergs and Elon <coughs> Musk, um, and I do think that one of the things that we as engineers naturally know how to do is problem solve. There are a number of sectors that by nature can then create and market and commercialize those things. And I think if there's anything that we can learn from the computer engineering, software engineering side of the business is that they've almost got their model right. The rest of us can learn from them. Um, yes, venture capital business has become, um, is quite tricky. We only see what comes through the whole ranks of the seed funding, but they have a model to commercialize so that the engineer who doesn't know what that looks like, all of the other areas that fail, can then get it right. And I do think we need a little bit more platforms than that. Um, even disciplines, especially now that we are dealing with multidisciplinary aspects of engineering, we are no longer, I can no longer say so, I'm traditionally trained as a road and transportation engineer, I'm sorry, a civil and transportation engineer. So I, I, before I couldn't imagine that I could wake up one day and what part of a road could I commercialize and start running my own business. But now, with the use of technology, and with the use of multidisciplinary studies, I mean, I did operations research in my PhD, and if it wasn't an educational component, it is an algorithm that I could have been able to commercialize, patent, and sell that IP, because when I see airlines using it, um, it would have been uh, uh, something that could be able to make money. Uh, so I do think that as we become more multidisciplinary, we can learn a thing or two that the software engineers are looking at um, so that the parts where we are good at, we remain good at. So the CTO does not then become a CTO because he's now the owner of the organization. He stays creating, but somebody else who can be able to run the business and make the difficult decisions do it. And I think the venture capital model works really well. So that for me is the bright light and the lady who's developed the 360 app uh, for checkers, um, it was her third year project at WITS um, and you can imagine that component came through. So the fact that she still r runs her own business but was able to sell a product to somebody who needed it, then means we get to re stay doing what we enjoy but we don't try and run a business while doing that because the joy of, of, of developing and the joy of running a business look very different. Mm. Yeah. That's a very valuable contribution. I'm sure uh, the audience are pending down questions. We are going to have a question and answer segment uh, a little bit towards the end. Um, but uh, you, you raise a very good point there that, I as in, that makes me very interested as an in industrial engineer. You coming from a civil engineer background yeah. and uh, seeing the direction in which uh, the multidisciplinary aspect is becoming very, very important. Mm -hmm. So industrial engineering historically has been looked down upon uh, in terms of the other engineering sectors. But we're moving more and more into oh, yes. this multidisciplinary uh, uh, space where we are probably based the best place for people to take advantage of. Yes. Prof Kone, would you have a comment on that? Because I saw you were a little bit itching to say something when, when Dr. Dino was still <laughs> speaking. Thank you, Prince. Um, yes, um, being an academic and where we are, we do not double that much with entrepreneurship. We sort of 
are on the invention innovation kind of side and sort of on the left side of the whole process but working with companies and partners you see what often makes it successful and uh, uh, and, and and the one thing that we as a faculty is uh, realized a few years ago is that uh, really the exciting opportunities are when we are getting different disciplines together and and now I'm going to be a bit unfair to my civil engineering colleagues and so on. Uh, what is really, really nice to see is how industrialists grasp that on and actually lead that multidisciplinary teams. And every time we do that, it's one of them who's actually initiating that. And that's nice to see. To the fact that other discipline engineers join industrial engineering and say, we want to be part of you and we'll drive it from this side, which is nice. Uh, another comment as well that came in is, is um, uh, innovation happens on, on many levels, you know. Um, uh, you have the young guy who's taking a chance, and I think we're going to see a young guy in a moment who's taking a chance. Um, but it also happens in big companies, and, and I have to, and also with startups, and, and I'm working in a moment with two companies who are doing it in very different ways. The one is BMW, um, and BMW is a governance nightmare if you want to deal with them. And I just had a number of emails earlier today that took my attention away. Dealing with them in getting a contract agreed is a nightmare. Just to get a student through a process of publishing something, we need to jump through a number of hoops. But they had created a structure there, which is absolutely amazing, because what they want to do is they want to create a car that is sexy, okay, for maybe some of you, sexy, that you want to buy, and they are always there on the forefront of making that possible. And it's, again, a culture of innovation, multidisciplinary teams, involvement from leadership. I heard the amazing story out of that with a board level. Test drive. The members of the board, old Umis of 70, 80 years old, come and test drive the new BMW models because they want to make sure the BMW feel, whatever that is, is in that car. So that's involvement there. The other one that, that's quite exciting and I'm involved now is that, uh, do you know what, who's the fastest growing bank in the world at the moment? Any guesses? Time Bank, yes. Time Bank is the fastest growing, now that's that what they say, I'm not sure if that's true, that was not, it's not coming from a literature study though. Um, <laughs> But, but they changed the whole model, the business model. Instead of building brick and mortar, I think Capitec started doing that. Instead of building brick and mortar things, they are hijacking the retail companies out there and they piggybacking on that. And they are doing immensely by de delivering a cheap, fast product all over the world. And it's just, it's just different ways of this innovation is happening. And it, what's always exciting for me from a university perspective, becoming available, uh, 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 um, um, a part of this process, sometimes sort of on the edge of it, but just to see how they do that, which is very exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Pro, for those examples. But uh, what, struck, what struck me there was BMW, Time Bank, these are well-established organizations. How, how easy is it for the common man, the young man who's uh, writing a paper, who's trying to break through? I know, Prof Kumbu, you worked with the incubation hub at, at Kibela. How, how hard are you? How, because Prof Kony has just mentioned uh, where you have a company with systems and the culture of innovation. If I'm coming up with some idea and I, I want to make it out there, is there, is there a policy framework, is there a system that can be set up? Tell us from your experience with, uh, with Kibela, your incubation hub there. I think the unfortunate thing is that, uh, as uh, Prof uh, Shute has said, the, the world is not ready for entrepreneurial universities. I mean, I think all of us are aware that we've got uh, entrepreneurship development in higher education. Uh, those universities where those entrepreneurs in those ecosystems are being supported by the university. <coughs> Anyone who knows uh, entrepreneurs were being supported by the university. Because you can't expect an entrepreneur who you are developing as a university to be supported by somebody else outside before you support them as the university. I mean, already, what, what confidence will somebody else have when you, the university, who's running this program, is not even giving them one piece of business? Obviously, there are ethical dilemmas that need to be sorted out there, but I think we can get around those ethical dilemmas if we're deliberate about entrepreneurship in universities. 
I didn't even see one hand that went up to say, you know, our university. I know UCT. University does that. Not West does. Okay. I also okay. know UCT does. Okay. That's two. Is there some more? Salam Bosch is never behind. <laughs> <laughs> CSIR is not a university, but they also support. I think Tux also has like an innovation. Yeah. Exactly. And the students are being assisted by the university to sell to the university first before they sell to anyone else. I think if, even if they don't have capital investment, they have a mentorship and kind of going to be going to that way. Yeah. So, 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 so. Maybe I'm not coming out here. Yeah. I'm saying. The university has this entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship ecosystem, right? And who's the first customer for that young person? Who's got a product that is relevant to the university? Who's the first customer? That, that's my question. My question is not about uh, who, who is their support, is they, but who is the first client for that student? Especially if the student is a product that is relevant to the university. Mm. It should be the university. That's my mm. argument. Mm. But how do you expect somebody else to buy from the student when you who's developing the student is not buying from the student? Mm -hmm. That is the point that I'm trying to make. That yes, we say we're developing entrepreneurs, but sometimes the students develop products that we as the university consume in gazillions and we never buy from the entrepreneur. Already there, there's something that is not right. You know? And, and I, I, I think this conversation uh, uh, needs to elevate to that level where we say, yes, as universities, if there's a young person was maybe creating wonderful graphic art, rather than go and give um, the tender to some super rich company somewhere, support this young person, let them employ their friends, and then there's real entrepreneurship. We, 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 we're not just speaking about developing entrepreneurs, but we're actually creating them and making them thrive. Because as they say in entrepreneurship, who are the people who are going to help you out? It's your friends, the fools, and Family. <laughs> right. so, 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 so if university with your family is not buying into your ideas and you are having a product that is relevant for them, I think there's a problem. So, so I think that's the starting point. But for us, of course, with Kibela, um, we had a, a fantastic relationship because they also were willing, though they were not the university, to buy into some of the things our students were doing. So obviously they won't give them the whole scope of work, but they'll give them an enough scope of work for them to experiment and have an experience with what it means to deliver product to industry, which is also very peculiar because other people came and said, well, maybe this is not a very good idea to work with students. And you know, this is where, yes, these are ideas, but somebody has to uh, give them the, the climate and the environment for them to work. And most of the times, I think we're willing to talk about it, but when it comes to actually practicalizing it and making it happen, I think it's a different story and hopefully through this conversation we can find each other on how we can actually talk about these things but also translate them into reality because for Kibela they were supposed to have a supplier park where you know suppliers were supposed to be um, housed just next to the factory the supplier park never happened but there's a lot of SMMEs that have been supported to be part of the value chain and part of those SMMEs are some of the students that you know, work with us, which is good, but I think we can do even more. Uh, I, I think there's they, they scope for doing even more than that, so that entrepreneurship is not just spoken about, but students, when they are taught, taught, told about it, they can actually see it walk in the streets. Th thank you so much, Prof. Uh, friends, family, and fools, I love that. Prof. Pat, you seem to be itching to contribute. Yeah, I, I, I must say, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite inspired, because uh, we, we are speaking the same language. But perhaps uh, let me throw uh, the spanner in the works and ask this question that we always ask but never come with an answer. Are entrepreneurs born or developed? But let me depart from the point that innovation and entrepreneurship are inseparable. But the one thing that uh, uh, Prof. Bofu is raising is the support. If you can ask a question amongst the uh, entrepreneurs on challenges that they are facing, there are three things that they talk about. They will talk about support, they will talk about access to markets, but they will also talk about funding. So we, we need to develop a very strong entrepreneurial ecosystem 
but also incubation. And these are things that we are quite aware of, but we just don't seem to implement. Because if you create that value chain, it becomes easier for these uh, entrepreneurs uh, to thrive because uh, you create a, a network of interconnected individuals, uh, institutions, including universities, you know, uh, to support entrepreneurship. Because entrepreneurship, by the way, is a science. Because uh, beyond innovation, I, we are all aware of many entrepreneurs who have never gone through formal education. Very few of those succeed. Very few of them succeed, you know. Uh, and I would not want to suggest that those are the odd ones. But there is need, a need to formalize entrepreneurship through uh, business model, innovation, uh, through uh, incubation, including scaling. I mean, we need to rethink, redesign the way value is extracted uh, and captured uh, in any business. Maybe if I was to give you one uh, little example in the education system, we need to formalize entrepreneurship. In the Department of uh, Education and Housing, we collaborate on a program of reorganization of schools. There are schools uh, of uh, focus or schools of specialization, and entrepreneurship is one of those programs. I went to a program uh, recently where learners are supported, they are given access to markets, they have their own. Uh, 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 they plant vegetables uh, at the school level. Some of their inventions, by the way, win prizes and they are ready for commercialization. That's where institutions like universities of higher education and research institutions come in and support with patents to ensure that these entrepreneurs thrive. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Are entrepreneurs made or they are born? Um, I'm going to open the floor to questions. Uh, you can raise your hands. Can direct them to the panelists. Was yes, Berto. Um, I have a question regarding entrepreneurship in the university environment. Um, not all of us are fortunate enough to come from from universities where there's a lot of predatory uh, system in place where where study leaders might take advantage of the student's idea when once they hear it and then um, yeah you know, so. Yeah, so how can we prevent that from happening where when we have entrepreneurial students who have these brilliant ideas and they need the support as soon as they talk to someone that person hijacks the idea and then commercializes it themselves. I know the Northwest University has taken great strides to like avoid that, but how can we prevent that in general at universities? So I'll give an example. We are in the process of digitizing um, EXA, long overdue. We are welcoming ourselves into the 21st century. Um, and uh, basically what you're saying, we were saying if we accredit engineering programs and we are looking for people that we need to update and digitize some of our components, why don't we rely on the students? Because we are basically saying you can hire these students. So we went out to the universities and we looked for groups of students. So we asked for groups of students. They needed to have sign off by their faculty and we needed them to then run a competition that we then called a hackathon. Technically it wasn't a hackathon, but we then picked the best team um, that could then be able to help us you know, bring our website into the 21st century. And when we were engaging, um, and it's Nelson Mandela University that won, and when we were engaging, um, our legal team was clear, mostly because there were going to be IP components. So we wanted to be able to contract with the person who is doing the work. So I think there needs to be an understanding because particularly where there's IP components involved, our, my suggestion is educate yourself um, so that you're also not handing over your algorithm or your code to your predatory supervisor. So in this particular scenario, the decision was made. We had a three-way discussion, and the decision was made, exercise the contract uh, with the student's company. 
So that's the one we signed the contract with, but the university supervisor who was overseeing them um, remained the project owner and got paid as part of the project team, but we contracted with the people who are doing the work. So you can't be able to be like that because no business wants to get into disputes on the basis of IT. I think everybody has learned Vodacom and please call me. It looks really bad. Uh, nobody walks away shining in such a scenario. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bridget, for, for a good, good response. Any other question? No question. OK, great. So what we're going to do now um, is I'm going to put uh, one of our entrepreneurs who is in the room on the spot. So our, our presentation panel is suddenly morphed into the Dragon's Den panel. <laughs> and um, Jamie, are you up for it? Can you do it? Elevator pitch. <laughs> Thanks, man. Come. Good stuff. Let's do it. Oh, you can come up. You need to come up so everybody sees you. Come, come. Come so everybody sees you. Goodness gracious, this is a uh, short notice, but here we are. You're an entrepreneur. Let's see. Let's see what you got. If there's ever a time for growth, it's now, it seems. I um, already said the university is going to support you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just pitch the product, I guess, or what, just that. Pitch your business. Yeah, we want to see who's going to want what percent of your business. OK, and fair enough. <laughs> and they're going to tell us what, okay. where they feel. I won't be going into any like financial things, I guess, at this moment in time. But uh, generally speaking, I'll give you the gist of what it's all about. Um, there's, a, there's a saying that we all know. Uh, you know, it's not about what you know, it's, it's who you know. But I like to add a bit of a different swing to that, where it's not about what you know, it's not no, wait, hold on. It's not about what you know. It's not just. Oh, hold on, wait, hold on. It's not about what you know. It's who you know. Hold on. Hold on. Here we go. Here we go. It's not again. It's not about what you know. It's who you know, right? So it's not about what you know. It's not just who you know, but it's about how you know them. <laughs> so here we go. Here we go. So I tap to questions about uh, helping people foster meaningful connections, as we truly believe that the currency of life is not money but meaningful connections. So as a product, I actually was supposed to bring this up. We're going to bring some products for the pitch. Is that good? So here we go. Uh, so from a product perspective, there's two main pieces. There's the hardware, so you can feel it everywhere. There's the hardware side, which is a stainless steel card laser engraved with an embedded NFC chip and a QR code at the back printed. Then there's a software aspect to it, which is a PWA, Progressive Web Application, which simply means that it is web-based and hence an app is not required on anyone's phone in order to use the product and is Android and iOS compatible. Um, I don't know what else I'm supposed to say now. But yes, that is the product itself. Um, yeah. How, how much are you looking for? How big do you want to grow? <laughs> um, what problem are we solving? <laughs> yeah, so it's helping people communicate their digital selves. We believe that um, from a digital perspective, from 2024 and beyond, um, you know, the digital self is required. <laughs> sorry. So, um, sorry, guys. Okay, it's just good. Well done. So <laughs> <after you>. <laughs> 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 sit, you can sit for your feedback. Right. Call you and uh, say something. This one. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe something you missed in your pitch now is that one of your biggest assets is the data that you're building up. No, no, you must first give a live demo. Nobody knows what he's talking about. Okay, let's have the feedback. Uh, we'll start with Connie and we'll come right up to the end. and then. No, but I have not advantage because I have a live demo. I actually have the product in my pocket as well. Yeah, so, you're so I'm already sold on the product now. <laughs> But, but maybe a question here is, is what is your business model? How are you, gonna, how are you going to survive? Um, so, so fundamentally, there's obviously a price to the product, and hence uh, the more I can move from a volume standpoint, obviously the more I then make. 
Uh, but many mentors of mine and many people that I've spoken to have suggested um, the more subscription model because obviously you can't always go look out for sales. Um, but there's a kind of a bigger play uh, at the moment where hopefully the business card is kind of the, the first point in and then hopefully one of these days there's a platform or so where you are able to search other people's business cards, so to speak, and therefore see their entire digital self and hopefully foster a better connection uh, accordingly. Good. Good answer. You Dr. can speak. Bridget. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I do think in your elevator pitch you should talk quite a bit about greening because I think it is the number one biggest thing. Number two, the power of a cell phone mm. is quite important because everybody has a cell phone. What I would ask you to, my only question to you is that how do you hope to get into the larger, you know, multinational type of organizations, mostly because this product, as you've said, has multi-use, right? So it can't just be a business card, but if I'm going to pitch a project, I can then load my presentation there, and then the individuals don't have to wait, I log in and so on and so forth. So my suggestion is how scalable is this card so that it can just not house just my data, but when I need to be able to put additional data, I can be able to do that on the same card, or do I need different cards? Because that's where you could charge a large organization to be able to manage it. That would be my first one. And then the second one, of course, would be for me data integrity uh, aspects. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Bridget. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's two main pages to the product, which is your profile itself, uh, and that is designed to look like a phone, so it's intuitive to the user, as we all know what a phone looks like. Um, and then there's an edit details page, and what that allows you to do is change your information as you go. So if a new project kind of pops up, or possibly a new product, or it's in the financial services, if you have a new product that's possibly uh, come up, you're able to then add that, or if you're a property agent, you could add your listings, um, things like that. And from a data integrity perspective, it's housed in AWS, and um, Apparently NASA is also on AWS, according to my developer, and hence if you can hack NASA, then you can hack me, I guess. Um, but that's, it's as secure as it pretty much comes, to my understanding. Um, but specifically from a large organization perspective, I think um, the gentleman from California, Ahmed, spoke about the whole value concept and what is value. I think the biggest thing for me is determining what is valuable to that company digitally and how can I communicate to them how they can use this card to then explain that side of their, their, um, yeah, their product, so how can I, so for example, again, in property, I would speak about their listings, in financial services about that, or uh, maybe in, let's say, the academic environment, I know that, uh, that your research gate profile is important, possibly H, uh, ORC ID, H index, things like that, affiliations apparently is quite a big thing, so how can I communicate that quickly? Okay, thank you, Jamie. Uh, let's, uh, let's have Kumbu's comments, then Dino and, uh, and uh, Pat, in that order, then you come in. Yeah. Well, great product. Thank you, sir. Um, which university are you from? Stellenbosch. Have they bought it already? Almost. We're going to be And for me, this is exactly the point. I mean, there's a pain point here. Um, they, they, Give they, me your how many staff members? 10,000 in Stellenbosch? 10,000 staff members? Yeah, you know, so already you've got 10,000 clients, you know, so Absolutely. Uh, your, your problems are solved very quickly. The, the VC adopts this, before you know it, it's at the ministry and all the higher education institutions are working with it. Thank you, Prof. Awesome. It's already moving, you know, so, so, so that, 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 that's exactly my point about discomfort. I mean, people are discomfort because it looks like this one can have all your cards in it. Absolutely. So you just carry this along. That's yes, it. Yeah. Good stuff, thank you. Dr. Dino? Yeah, I think uh, my question is, uh, what is your competition? Mm -hmm. And if you don't have competition right now, who are, who are those uh, out there that will quickly be able to configure their businesses to become a competitor? And how quickly could they do that? Okay, that's fine, you answer at the end. Prof. Pat, your contribution? No, I, I must say, I find this to be quite interesting. Uh, I'm thinking about it uh, in another environment where I operate in the rail industry. But generally in the transport industry, how yeah. can you adapt it uh, for the transport industry? Because the province is moving towards an integrated fare system. 
such that uh, you will need to use one card for intermodal transport uh, systems. So if you are able to give me a solution there, maybe practically one can give you an opportunity to go and pitch. Uh, and I'm glad you are coming from my alma mater. You are coming from Stellenbosch. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's yes, great. <laughs> All the reasons I must support. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, obviously, it's, uh, like three reasonably in-depth questions, obviously. Um, the first thing I'd just like to add to the, to the first question, which um, I actually spoke to the Tiff about yesterday, which was this one thing going from zero to one, then one to a hundred. And the point is, capital is one thing, purchasing the product, but also customer feedback and understanding what can break and what the problems are was probably the biggest hurdle for me, not, not so much capital. So I think if universities can assist in that, I think that's almost the biggest thing, just feedback of what, how else can I make it better. Um, the second question from competition is the question every entrepreneur asks, I guess, you know, who else is out there that could possibly do this? And I think the answer to that is what, what you actually touched on earlier, which I, I quite enjoyed and it's something I've been thinking about all day, every day, which is just really how hard it is. And um, the point there is, is that I truly believe, um, we're a team of six now, that all day, every day, 12 hours a day, there's a lot of innovation that goes into that and a lot of conversation and things and that big companies aren't always agile enough to be able to adapt to that. So therefore, I do believe that if I niche into it and keep going and we you know, put all our energy into it, it's, you know, there will be competition, but um, I believe we can do it better, I guess. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jamie, for being such a good sport. Thank you. Appreciate it. So we're about to round off this uh, discussion. Um, final chance Q&A from the audience. Thank you, Prince. I would like to ask our own prof, Cornet, now that we have this great insight of employing our innovators, using their products, how can we as an audience be guaranteed that um, Jamie might have a formal interview with Stellenbosch <laughs> for him to incorporate this product? And then I'll ask a second question after our guaranteed speech. Well, maybe the first thing I'm going to say is that uh, Jamie had highlighted a gap in our education, and that's how to do an elevator pitch. So we need to train him better. <laughs> to this might not be the right platform <laughs> corner to answer that. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. uh, d guarantees? There's no guarantees. He will have to come and do the sell job. He will have to come and present a nice model, business model, that's going to be attractive to university. That's hard life out there as well. And, 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 and I'm pushing him for a discount, and we're going to discuss it. And as it's nice, it's actually very nice models you can link to that thing, I think. Uh, uh, Carl just behind you had said, think about the data behind this. Think about the data, the wealth of data is going to be captured here as well. So there's a lot of other benefits that you can go and link to this thing. And I think we need to be very creative in managing and selling this into an organization as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Prof. And I'm um, also saying thanks to Jamie. Um, that was a great pitch, and you stand your, you stood your man. So <laughs> now that I'm also involved in this project, um, can I buy some stocks, Jamie? Is, um, are you listed on JSE yet? <laughs> okay, good stuff. Thanks. Thank you. Any other question? One more to be the final. I must tell you, Jamie's gotten an interview with my marketing team. Excellent. Here you go. <laughs> Jamie, when you listen to this, Jamie, when you glow big, don't forget Sai. <laughs> Hello. Okay. <Yes. laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we have uh, professors, yes, doctors, and so forth. I'm of the view that we do have a disconnect somehow, and I support everything that has been said by Professor Kumbulani. It's a good thing that the uh, varsities need to pro uh, support their students. I'm, however, of the view that this thing should start higher from, for instance, Department of uh, Higher Education, Science and Technology, and obviously uh, SM uh, SMMEs, 
with that's being said i would like to connect that from that level to the varsities and right through to the person who's trying to achieve something through their innovation and entrepreneurship so i would like to know what, where are the gaps and why is this being said at that level however it's not filtering all the way to the person who needs it the most please assist me in answering that and perhaps we can do something about it to even approach those departments we should in my view have representation okay th thank you donald prof kumbu quick one quickly please yes i think from my end uh, si i think it's a challenge that we need to put right in front of us and say that this is what we're going to uh, solve for because that speaks to the poverty it speaks to the unemployment it speaks to inequality in our society you know half the problems we discover we're solving are not speaking to our social dynamics it's speaking to 10% of the population and the other 90% everyone has forgotten about it so 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 i agree with you 100% i think as i i've seen been in the past with putting put effort into um, how we can make uh, local government effective <coughs> you know because ultimately a majority of our population that's where they are stuck inefficient services thank you but thank as was said earlier on it's hard work and we must just give it to ourselves and i think our first keynote is also a very good example of what's possible with industrial engineers that value chain solutioning uh, mindset you know because as industrial engineers we, jo we don't just think one part of the chain we think the entire value chain and i think that's very key thank you are you referring to donovan yes okay thank you i, I hope everyone heard him <laughs> thank you thank you prof Yes, uh, doctor. I and make that your closing statements. As yes, well. I do think there is a disconnect between higher education and DSI. Uh, mostly because I did work at the CSIR and I also worked in academia. So the CSIR is almost the home where that happens. Um, and DSI then funds CSIR and through that, that is where innovative solutions that are helpful happen. So I do think the disconnect happened when universities and CSIR sort of started competing, not just for people, but IP and projects and so on. But the grant funding that DSI gets that gives CSIR, and because that pot is getting smaller and smaller, CSIR then takes more of it, and I think universities take less of it. Uh, but ideally, that's what the parliamentary grant funding in DSI is supposed to do identify what solutions people can come up with that can be able to solve uh, problems that we have later. And the CSIR is the home where a lot of that is happening and not higher education institutions. So if we were to bridge that gap, I think we could then be able to close that quite quickly. Thanks. Thank you, Doc. Dr. Dino, closing statements? Um, yeah, I just want to just shift the, uh, the discussion to a little bit out of the entrepreneurs space because a lot of people maybe in the audience are working for uh, maybe larger companies and they're at the beginning stages of their careers and so they, they may never be entrepreneurs so how will they take advantage of innovation and I think the one um, experience that I had um, in SAB Miller many years ago was that metrics and drivers of innovation are important so just one small decision was taken um, strategically to say that on pricing and costs, um, they would be contained to 85% of inflation. So if you were a middle manager and you were doing your budgets, all your costs in your budget had to be at 85% of C CPI or inflation. And in those days, the inflation was quite high, so it was quite a big number. And what that did is that every department, every function, every year had to focus on doing the same with, with, less, with less funding or more with less funding. And that was amazing. It drove, it drove the whole organization to produce the cheapest beer in the world um, over a period of 10 years. So, and everybody in their small ways contributed to innovation. So, um, you know, innovation, as I, and I think as Corne said earlier on, can happen at all levels. Correct, and that yeah. was truly one way to do it. So, metrics 
and drivers are quite important. Thank you, Dr. Dino. I think you've matched that uh, discussion to many people here who work in corporate. Just drive your, your metrics and be efficient. Uh, Prof. Pet, closing statements? Look, uh, I, I think we need to temper with the structure of our curriculum, <laughs> especially uh, the basic education level. A uh, good thing that uh, some of the provincial education departments, you know, are, are turning uh, the corner. But we need to be brave and embrace technical and vocational training, training. instead of prioritizing the academic stream. Perfect. Good. Thank uh, you. But I would not have done my work. Uh, I, it's rare that I get the opportunity to sit with so many uh, knowledge creators, uh, engineers, and innovators. I still want us to promote our indigenous knowledge systems uh, for no knowledge creation. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much, Professor Pat. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for this uh, beautiful, you've been a wonderful audience and- Prince, 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 we forgot to answer his question. Which question? Thank Are you. entrepreneurs born <laughs> or trained? It, it's never so, answered. So, so <laughs> I have an answer though. All right, so, so I, I thought that was a rhetorical question. And <laughs> 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 but, but I've already failed to meet my objective of starting this on time. Let's have this conversation in the corridors so that at least I can try to finish on time, although we've, over, over, we've yes, overshot we've already. already. <laughs> Do you want to give it a shot, Prof? That I think they're prototyped. They are prototyped. Some of them start with a good birth, I guess, yeah. genes, whatever. <laughs> Others get some knowledge, and, and I think each every university actually tries to do that, but the entrepreneur actually becomes great by trying it. So I think a good entrepreneur is prototyped. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Good stuff. <laughs>